All right, I'm really excited about this panel. I this and it, it's a perfect segue from the uh, from the end of the last panel and talking about uh, technology and the future of ag technology and where it's going. This um, what traits are going to uh, be important. And uh, we got a little bit into the views of uh, consumers and the frustration with consumers and certain brand companies, which were not mentioned. And uh, our panel, we have some brand companies. We have some uh, people that are experts uh, in, um, in, in actually addressing and talking to consumers. And uh, also, uh, from the farmer side, uh, the issue that they have uh, struggled with in terms of uh, a consumer acceptance. And we want to talk about the lessons that we've learned over the last uh, 20 years and since uh, the first uh, genetically engineered uh, soybeans came onto the market in, in, the, in the late 90s. But more importantly, look ahead and uh, talk about what, what, what these lessons have taught us and um, just really ask the question, will consumers and can accept new technologies? And uh, if so, what will, it, uh, what will it take? So first up on our, our panel today is um, uh, Will, in the order from uh, closest to me, is uh, Will Brunt from Smithfield Foods. Will serves as Smithfield's Chief Innovation Officer. Previously, he was Smithfield's Senior Vice President of Marketing. In his current role as Chief Innovation Officer, he oversees Smithfield's Innovation Center and has responsibility for new product development. Will has broad experience in the marketing and advertising industries, particularly in the food and agribusiness spaces. And to his left is um, from uh, Campbell Soup Company is Kelly Johnston, Vice President of Government Affairs at Campbell. Uh, before joining Campbell, he's actually been there since 2002. Uh, Kelly served as Secretary of the Senate, the Senate's Chief Legislative Financial and Administrative Officer, and as a Staff Director of the Senate Republican Policy Committee. And he also has served as uh, Executive Vice President for Government Affairs and Communications at the National Food Processors Association, which is now part of Grocery Manufacturers Association. That's actually where I first got to know you, Kelly. That's been... We're dating ourselves. <laughs> we are dating ourselves. That's right. And to his left is Terry Moore, Vice President of Center for Food Integrity. Previously, Terry served as Director of Communications at USDA, Deputy Director of Communications at the White House, as a Chief of Staff in the U.S. Senate, uh, by Bill Hans, um, the former Secretary of Agriculture, and as a Communications uh, Director for the Governor. Based in D.C., she now guides companies, associations, and government agencies involved in food and ag to engage more effectively, conduct business more transparent, transparently, and demonstrate more clearly that they are worthy of public trust. And last on the panel, but not least, we have Scott Herndon uh, from the American Sugar Beet Growers Association. He currently serves as a general counsel. Prior to uh, uh, assuming the role of general counsel, he was a director of biotechnology and regulatory affairs for the organization. He has served as the director of global government and public policy for S&P Global and general counsel for the Republican Study Committee and he has experience in agricultural issues from both a business and a policy perspective. Okay, with that, we will uh, begin. And as I promised, I have a couple little uh, items here for show and tell. I warned Kelly I might do this. I recognize that can there, brother. <laughs> couple of, I hope you can see it, a, a couple of familiar uh, cans here of this one is uh, Campbell's tomato soup. The other one I think I got uh, yes chicken noodle. They have uh, the reason I got these. They have a label that uh, that many of you have uh, are probably uh, familiar with. Um, this one happens to, happens to say that uh, it is partially produced with genetically engineered um, ingredients. This one. 
uh, says the ingredients from corn and soy in this product come from genetically modified crops, and then has information about getting more information. Now, Kelly, you all famously did this in, I believe it was early 2016. Correct. At the time, uh, the industry was staring at this uh, first state labeling law in uh, Vermont that was set to take effect in July. Uh, Congress had not been able to agree on any kind of preemption. You all went forward with this labeling decision. Wasn't that a mistake? No, not at all. In fact, I think it's one of the best things we've done in my 16 years at Campbell. Uh, by the way, the difference, you mentioned two different labels. That tells me the first can of tomato soup, I believe, is older than the can of chicken noodle soup because the second label is the one that we're currently using and have been using for the better part of a year on our products. We made a commitment. We decided after, it wasn't just because of the Vermont law, although it was a, definitely a trigger for us. We were facing one Congress's inability to pass a law uh, and then facing a deadline having to actually print millions of labels in time to meet the new requirement of this one state for products sold in interstate commerce. And then we also had been through four very bruising state ballot initiatives, California, Oregon, Colorado, and I'm going to forget the others, Washington State, that where we spent literally as an industry millions of dollars to keep uh, mandatory GMO labeling off of packages. And we realized after all that frustration and all the bruising that we took, not just from the people who were opposed to what we were trying to do at the time, but said, wait a minute, what are we telling consumers by fighting disclosure, fighting transparency? We're telling consumers, in effect, and they were telling us this, that we had something to hide and there was something inferior and maybe something wrong with these ingredients or products. So we said, let's embrace this. Or as, uh, as Trey Grouty, congressman from from South Carolina said on TV this weekend, uh, if your client is innocent, act like it. So we said, let's embrace on package GMO labeling, give consumers the information they want, and we said, let's do it right. Now, the second label you mentioned is, is the first step of doing it right. Consumers told us through very transparent consumer research we did last uh, May of 2016 that they wanted to know exactly what was GMO in the product and here's the thing that we've not been able to add to the label yet, we hope we can over time, is that the FDA considers GMO crops to be safe. When you add those magic words to the label, consumers say, oh, no big deal. The government's looked at this and said it's fine. Now, we haven't gotten approval of that label yet because the FDA does not have mandatory pre-market approval or review authority for those kinds of, of, of for, for, F, for those, uh, GMO products. So we're trying to figure out what we can say that consumers will see as friendly, understandable, and provide the confidence. The thing we don't want to do is walk away from GMOs. Other companies just chose, well, we're just going to walk away. We're going to buy non-GMO cane sugar. We're going to buy non-GMO this. We're going to throw butterflies in our packages. And we all do that to some degree. But we said, we want to do this right. And we have found that if you trust consumers with the information, they have more confidence in the product. And that's what we think it was a good idea in the end. Okay. You mentioned uh, sugar. <laughs> Scott. Scott, because I'm going to go to you next. Uh, because you've had frontline experience with consumers and decisions by brand companies. In this case, as Kelly mentioned, uh, there were some companies that said mm, that uh, we're going to switch to cane sugar because consumers, whatever reason, some consumers don't want the, the GMO sugar. Now, your growers, your beet growers, uh, really switched in mass to Roundup Ready sugar beets when they came out. It, uh, from talking to growers, it's much more efficient, um, saved them a lot of money, and, and I think some will argue that it kept them in business, in actual. So there was, there was no way they were going to switch, switch back to conventional. But then you ran into this problem. What did you, uh, I didn't hear much from growers or any other, uh, other growers about it trying to defend their decision about taking these crops. You were fairly quiet. Um, what did you, what was your experience and did you learn anything from those years when you, up, up to when you ran into company switching? <clears throat> Well, you mentioned uh, defending the technology. We've been very 
active in defending the technology when involved in litigation for that. So we've been active on that front. But uh, as far as what we've learned, I think that uh, you know going forward, I think we are all going to be very involved in the process of discussing the technology. And an example of that, that's something that originated out of the beet sugar industry, is a education campaign or, or just a, starting a dialogue. It's called A Fresh Look. And you all feel free to look it up, afreshlook.org. This is something that's come out of the beet sugar industry, but uh, is now being supported by the Farm Bureau, by USFRA, and by uh, National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. So this is something that sort of tells people about the benefits of it. And what we've learned from this is when you tell people about the benefits of it, and in particular, uh, millennials, you mentioned millennials, millennial moms are very interested in the environmental benefits of uh, this technology and that it's a crop production method. It's not for sugar, it's not in the food, it's a cro crop production method. And then once people understand that, they, they become much more comfortable with it. So I think that's, that's something that we've learned is to talk about it. And uh, so that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what brought you to the decision that you needed to talk about it? Well, I think, uh, as you mentioned, there were some, you know, some companies that had switched to that, but uh, we've seen that a lot of companies have, have come back to us. So that sort of, uh, you know, people that, when there was some uncertainty, some companies uh, switched, but uh, once there was some, some clarity, regulatory clarity, uh, our customers came back to us. So they recognize that there's no difference in the sugar. Um, you know, there are huge, very intense battles for marketing share. And so some, you know, cane folks or, or other just in general, people are going to try to put labels on a wheat. You know, our companies fight for market share among the beet sugar sector. So marketing is something that's, that's very important. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that, uh, that people are coming back and uh, realizing that uh, there's, there's nothing different in the regulatory certainty. And I, I, we hope to see the proposed rule very soon. So, I mean, I think all of us would really like to see the proposed rule on biotech labeling, uh, the, the standard which we expect to come out. I mean, I, I think it'll have to come out pretty soon if they're going to get it, uh, get the final rule out on time. So that should provide some more clarity. But uh, that that did that did help uh, sort of calm calm the uh, the market a lot. Okay, I want to come back. To that we'll talk about the about the rule and <clears throat> what it should say. Well, uh, again, you all have had a little different experience, not so much with uh, with the GMO issue, but uh, with uh, other, particularly the some of the animal welfare, uh, the gestation crate issue, you phased out of those, and the antibiotic issue, technology issues, which you've obviously been on the, in the forefront of. What have you all, what have you learned from your experience, particularly with those, with the gestation crate issue and that phase out and the antibiotic issue, what have you learned about consumers, how you have to talk to consumers, and, and, and how much of a difference does it make when you do? I'm going, to, I'm going to start the answer to this question in a little bit of a roundabout way that may seem a little strange. Um, I spent a lot of time in supermarkets wandering around looking at products on shelves and looking at consumers. Your that better? So for those of you who didn't hear that, I, I, I spent a lot of time in supermarkets wandering around looking at products and not listening to consumers when they don't really know I'm listening to them. Um, and I, I tell you a quick story. I was in a, a supermarket in my hometown of Smithfield. And I was listening to this couple come up to the meat case. And they were an average looking couple. They would, you know, you wouldn't, they wouldn't stand out in any way, shape, or form. And the man and the woman, they walked up to this case and we happened to be running a special on loop sausage. Two loops, two pounds of meat for $5. And the woman turned to the husband and said, can we get that for dinner tonight? And, and she wasn't asking him whether he wanted it for dinner. She was asking whether that was something they, you know, could put in their basket as they managed their bills for the month. Um, so I ask you to hang on to that thought for a second. The, the gestation pen um, topic is about 10 years ago, there was a lot of conversation about raising, uh, putting hogs in gestation stalls or in gestation pens. And there was a lot of debate back and forth on which was healthier for the hog. And there's still a lot of debate on that. But the prevailing winds and a lot of the talk that was going on was that pens were better for the, for the animal welfare of, of, the, of the hog. Of, of the sow. And we made a commitment 10 years ago that by 2017, we would have converted all of our company owned farms to gestation pens. And we did that. We completed that last year at, at the tune of $360 million expense to the company. So as we're installing these 
depends, and all of our customers are very happy that we're doing this. We went to our customers, our, the, not the consumer, but our customers, and said, okay, we're doing this. We can guarantee you that all of the meat that we're selling to you will come from, from gestation pens. What's that worth? And there was a resounding silence in the room. Nothing. We've done that, and we have not received any economic value back for that $360 million investment. Now, we're happy we made that, but if you, you know, on an ROI, if you're ever submitting an ROI in a company and the ROI is zero, generally that, your boss or CFO looks at you and kind of questions how long you've been in your role and whether you should be in it much longer. Um, I mean, we're glad we did it, and we committed to do that for animal welfare. But what we learned really quickly is that the people talking about issues, about products, are often not the people buying the products. And the reason our customers weren't going to pay us for that is because a penny more per pound is because their customers, the end consumer, wasn't going to pay them a penny more for the pound. So, I mean, it's really, when, you, when we talk about people speaking out on issues, oftentimes we've got to clarify who's talking about the issue and who's actually buying the product. Um, I, I think, and we've talked about this, I think when you, when you talk about um, hormones and steroids and antibiotic usage, it's interesting. What we learned, and we've done a lot of labeling research, is when, when you talk to consumers, it's what's immediate, what's substantial, and what's certain in their lives. I, I think when, you, when I, I look at it, hormones and steroids, the, the hormone issue, we all know. We, we have children and we question their, their growth rate and certainly, you know, their maturity and, and, and we want that to go on pace and the concern of buying something that has a hormone on, in it that might disrupt that. That's immediate, it's fairly certain, and to a parent, it's fairly substantial. When I look at antibiotics, that's societal's, you know, will our society have antibiotics that are good for human use in 10 or 15 years? Not very immediate. Not very certain because if innovation follows on that, we solve the problem. And it's not substantial to me right now, it's societal. So I think w when we talk about these issues, if you drill down to the end consumer, you start getting a, a little bit different story than the people talking, oftentimes. Okay. Terry, I'd like to get, uh, like to get your reaction, reaction to that and to the others. But uh, first of all, I, I want to come back to an issue that was raised. It's, it's raised in every conversation we have about biotech, and it was certainly raised on the last panel. And that is what, what the industry did wrong that we got into this issue with, with GMOs and, 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 concern, and consumer resistance to, to the extent that there is to GMOs. What, what went wrong and what have we learned? You bet. So we've heard a lot of talk about productivity and efficiency once again today. Part of the reason the public mistrusts the food system is because the growth, you know, it's that big is bad notion, that big bias, and they mistrust a big company because they think as you grow, you're going to put profit ahead of the public interest, right? So when we talk about productivity and efficiency and farmer profitability, none of that resonates with the consumers. And in fact, it only increases their level of mistrust, right? You heard some talk this morning, and clearly there's an awakening within the food system that's, that's a really positive thing, because I do think we have an opportunity with gene editing. But you heard Andy and Allison talk about the benefits of gene editing framed from the consumer's perspective in a way that will mean something to them. Eliminating allergens in food. Moms that won't have to worry about sending their kids to school because the kid next to them might have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Or all the gluten concerns. Um, eliminating animal diseases so that there will be less animal suffering. Will the farmer be more profitable if their animals don't die? Absolutely. And there was a time when we probably would have talked about that in terms of farmer profitability. But that time is not now. We know that consumers care about animal health. Uh, there's a lot of talk about sustainability as well. And absolutely that word has been hijacked. Who knows what it means now? And it doesn't mean much to consumers because of that. But when you drill down to what it's supposed to mean, protecting the environment, consuming fewer natural resources, that message does resonate, and it's very relevant to this discussion. So it's, it's fascinating to hear 
Um, I will tell you that we've also traditionally taken a very defensive posture. As, as the consumers have become more skeptical, um, even trade organizations, right? They're the defenders of their members. But if we take that posture, that defensive posture, then we're immediately setting ourselves apart from the consumers, as opposed to inviting their questions. You know, trade organizations becoming ambassadors for their members. You, you can see, you can look across the landscape and see that they are enjoying more success with that and starting to realize that that outreach really pays off. Ambassadors, remember, yes, and I want this, you all be able to, to feel free to respond to each other. Yeah, Scott, go ahead. <clears throat> so, Philip, I'd also like to say something that we've learned from this whole process is that I think we, and I, I think I can say for all of agriculture, felt like if something came through the regulatory process, you know, the coordinated framework, FDA, EPA, USDA, and had that regulatory stamp of approval that had been looked at very carefully and had no issues whatsoever, that consumers would feel comfortable with it. But that's, that's not been the case. And that's, I think that's probably been the biggest learning experience we've had is that it's going to take much more of a dialogue versus just allowing the government stamp of approval. That's not enough these days. And similarly, I would add to that that we long thought science was the answer, right? Well, if science says it's okay and safe, surely that's enough. And when consumers weren't convinced by that, we said, okay, well, here's another study and more results. Well, here's another study. Why didn't that work? Because it really comes down to the values. And we've been doing consumer research around trust in the food system for 10 years, and I can tell you that even our most recent research, as strongly as ever, validates that if you don't have that ethical grounding when you talk about what you're producing, it doesn't resonate. Hmm. Terry, I, I, wanna, I want you to talk a little, I want to talk about messages a little bit, but first of all, I want to talk about consumers and what you all, and each of you has had, certainly Kelly, you and Will have also had a direct experience with, uh, with consumers, um, and, and if not through your customers, Will, in the case of Smithfield. How do you, it, Terry, you spend a lot of time doing research on consumers and with consumer and consumer groups trying, uh, and you've, you've done some work uh, figuring out which groups uh, you have to, to have to reach. Right. Uh, so talk a little bit about that and what you've, what you've found. We know consumers are Who not are monolithic, right? So there's all kinds of different segmenting out there, but in, the, in recent years we have um, utilized a research tool called digital ethnography. So you know the old kind of ethnography where a sociologist stands in the living room and observes behavior. Well, digital, we're following the many, many breadcrumbs we leave online now, and sociologists are looking at that and saying, what are your beliefs and values and motivations? And it's completely unbiased because we're just looking at posts and likes and comments, and it's absolutely fascinating to see. Certainly validates that notion that we need the ethical grounding. So right around, we broke it down to five different groups, the scientifics, which accept science. So it, it all relates to your um, relationship to the truth, right? We, live, we talk about this post-truth society. So if truth is objective and fact-based to you, you're in that scientific group, which is a whopping 6% of the population. There's another 50% for whom truth is both relative and objective. And they want to know, yes, they want the science, but they want the ethical grounding for the science. Not only do I want to know if the science says you can, I want to know why we should. And if you can make that case, so there's 9% that we categorize as the philosophers, and they're influencing another 39%, which are the followers, and they're the folks who say, enough. I'm tired of conflicting studies. I'm tired. I can't navigate all the information out there. Just tell me clearly what you do and what I should do and why it's the right thing to do. So definite validation of, of the power of shared values. Hmm. Kelly, what's, uh, what's been your, your experience at, at Campbell in terms of how do, you, how, how do you see consumers breaking down and how do you speak, do you have to speak to them differently? What? You sure do. Uh, it's interesting because uh, with the advent of social media over the last several years, there was a big rush by people who clearly had 
strong agendas that were that fed a lot of the perceptions that we're battling with today. Uh, and there was clearly air supremacy in social media by a lot of the, and I'm going to mention some names, Food Babe, Dr. Oz's of the world. They had millions of followers in some cases, while uh, food trade associations might have 3,000. Uh, so clearly there was a, a big message vacuum there. I think that much of that has been overcome, and I salute the farm and ag community for really stepping up. There have been some magnificent new bloggers, uh, Farm Babe, other people who've stepped in and really tried to share information with consumers. Here's how we raise your crops. Here's how we raise your animals. And I think that's done a lot to provide people more information and more comfort about the way it's, it's, uh, that, that food has grown. In addition, whenever a, some outrageous, crazy accusations made about a, a, quote, chemical or an ingredient in a food product, I'm seeing the farm and ag community respond instantaneously to say it's not true, here are the facts. So I think, and, and that really has a, a, an impact on consumers. Clearly, um, there's two major drivers to what's going on with consumers now. One is technology, uh, how they get their information. Clearly, the Internet's become the top source for information about food now over, over anybody else. But number two, the demogra demography. Uh, the new generation, the millennials, now outnumber boomers. Their buying power now exceeds that of boomers, and their attitudes and perceptions have, are very different than the older generations, Gen X, Gen, and certainly the boomer generation. And that's been very disruptive. I would also say, too, that consumers are more in the driver's seat now than I've ever seen them in for two major reasons. Well, actually, one major reason. One, of course, demographics. But number two is technology through e-commerce. E-commerce has changed everything in the United States. So it's been a very disruptive time. So consumers are in the driver's seat. So we're going to be much more sensitive to what any segment of consumers want or do. So perceptions are important. And we have seen what happens when false perceptions will get around the world. There was a study just done recently that showed that falsehoods travel the globe about three times faster than the truth. So you have to be mindful of that and how you respond and, and do that. We see consumers, again, as a, as a wide variety. Uh, you've got roughly 20, 25% of consumers that we call your health and well-being consumers, the ones that really want to do the right thing. They're careful shoppers. They read the labels. They go to the, they believe, the most responsible retail outlets. Uh, they know what they want to buy. They're most attractive to some of the newer, smaller brands. They have a suspicion about bigger companies. Um, they have a lot of buying power. On the other end of the, of the, of the spectrum are people like my 20, young 20-ish boys who are just very happy to pull up something out of the cupboard, don't care what's on the label. They're the eat, drink, and be merry crowd, and they're out there as well. They're your younger males who just, you know, or just think you're indestructible and just enjoying life. Then there's a whole bunch of folks in the middle, and there's a whole gamut of those. Terry talked about some of them, and a lot of them, probably the most persuadable and most important group for many of us in the consumer space are those mothers with kids at home, because they're still the prime, even though dads are moving up the list in terms of, of buying in the stores, it's those moms with the young kids at home or kids at home that are still the major influencer. And they're the ones that are saying, well, you know, I've heard concerns about GMOs, but you know what, I'm not, gonna, I'm not willing to pay more for non-GMO. And there's a lot of those kind of consumers that are out there. So that's kind of how, I'm being very general here, but there's definitely a lot of segments, like Terry indicated, a lot of great research going on, but those are the ways that, that many food companies look at consumers right now. So how do you, uh, for Will, how do, how do you, do you go to the toughest consumer to reach? Is that where you, you, you direct your message? Uh, some would say the lowest common denominator. <laughs> what do you do? I'll, 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 we'll. I'll echo what you were saying at the end. <laughs> you know, we, we sit, and, and I'm a, probably a big contrary on this. I probably have a view that's wildly different, or I don't know whether politically incorrect or whatever you'll call it. We sit in a hotel like this where your room's $300 a night, and we sit around with crystal chandeliers and talk in microphones, wearing suits and ties. The average household income in this country is 56, household, not individual, household is $56,000 a year. By the time you've made your rent or mortgage payment, by the time you've made your car payment, by the time you paid for your cell phone, your cable, if you can afford it, because that's you know $200 a month, I mean, or basic cable, you're not left with a heck of a lot. And at the end of the day, do you really care? Does that couple that's sitting in front of that counter in the supermarket in Smithfield, they may feel better that it's non-GMO, but they, even if they want, could they afford a dollar more? Could they afford 50 cents more? I mean, I don't know how many people in this room have questioned whether two pounds of protein was worth $5 on your last shopping trip. So I think we all have to keep perspective on, that's, that's the median household income. So 
half the country by population makes less than 56,000 household income. I, I, this may sound wildly contrarian, but I don't think that bottom half can, I mean, they may care, but they can't afford to change their purchase decision despite their caring. So I think, and I'll go back to it, we went to gestation pens. That was the right decision. For animal welfare, it was the right decision. Economically for our company, if you looked at it, it was not the right decision. Short term, long term, what that gets us is being a good corporate citizen and starts dispelling the perception in the society today that doing well and doing good are mutually exclusive. I think we've got a real problem with that. Correct. And I think as companies, we have to keep putting our foot forward and spending the money to prove that doing well and doing good are concomitant and not mutually exclusive. And at the end of the day, that will earn us that trust of consumers. And then when we start getting into advancements that have them concerned, like GMOs, we as organizations will have greater trust in that area. But I, I would argue, that, I mean, there was a conversation, someone, I think it was Nina was talking about, you know, the idea of growing meat in a lab. If, if we could actually do that, the economics of our business, Smithfield, would, I, I, I can't even, there's distribution, there's storage, there's feeding, there's manufacturing, the animal welfare of, of not harvesting animals. I mean, the, the implications of that are mind numbing. And the ability to drastically reduce food costs in this country, I mean, we wouldn't have seen anything like that since the McCormick Harvester. It would, it would drop so much, I, I don't think anybody would care, honestly. I mean, that's my personal opinion. 8% of our country is food insecure. I guarantee you they won't care. But if you could cut the cost of a ribeye from $14 a pound to $4 a pound, GMO, I, don't, I, don't, I think you start clearing up the cloud of GMO really quick. And that's a real point is that the consumer, that's, that's one of the lessons I think that we've learned from the whole 20, 30 years of this GMO debate is that so many of the benefits were perceived to be for, for farmers, which is great, but there were no perceived consumer benefits. And that's why I think that as we look at this new wave of technology coming our way, one which we're very excited about as a company, by the way, we're not anti-technology at all. We, we are going to tell consumers about it. Uh, we don't think they have to be called GMOs, uh, which indicates that we really have an education process to, to step in here. But as consumers see the benefit of these, whether it's like you mentioned, the, the peanut butter, you don't have to worry about it anymore there's no, because the allergen has been removed thanks to the, this new technology, then I think consumers start getting real excited. And, and that's why I think the most interesting part of the whole genetic editing debate is, is it's unlike GMOs, which was really about plants and transgenic, we're starting off talking about humans and animals. It's not about plants. You don't hear, and I, went, I went on the web to research genetic editing and all the research was about humans so, and, and disease eradication. So it tells me that, boy, talk about potential benefits that could cascade to the food and ag world is pretty impressive. And I do like the stories I've seen about genetic editing, for example, in the animal spectrum with dehorning and whatnot. So I do think there's, as long as consumer benefits kind of help lead the way in this, it may help make acceptance that much easier to achieve. And I would like to add to the consumer benefit. I think is, you know, the population is changing and you have millennials who have more of a social, they, they sort of look at things through a social construct of, you know, how they can make the world a better place, That's, uh, which, is, which is great. And I'd like to read you a quote from uh, Bill Gates. He said recently that uh, GM, GMO foods are, are perfectly healthy and the technique has the possibility to reduce starvation and malnutrition when it is reviewed in the right way. And that's something we've all known for a very long time. You know, as long as this technology has been around, we've understood that. But I think it's helpful to have someone like uh, Bill Gates, who is running uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, trying to feed the world, make that kind of statement and take some of the stigma out of this. And then you also add in the, the environmental benefits. Then people start to think about it, you know, yes, there's a, there could be a, a direct consumer benefit, but there's actually a social benefit to the GMO technology that I think is, you know, getting that message out there is incredibly helpful. Scott, can I ask you real quick for, I, I want to get, your, your experience in, you mentioned your Fresh Look yeah. Uh, yeah. initiative that, that you as sugar beet growers did to try, try to communicate directly with consumers. That's right. And I, I think primarily millennial moms, yeah, is that's that right. correct? Yeah, tell, so just, tell me what you learned about talking to them in terms of what they wanted to hear, what resonated with them. And so the, the millennial folks. moms, they were, they were interested in the, the health. I mean, that was one thing because they're you know, raising kids, wanted to understand that the GMO, the food uh, grown with GMO technology is safe. 
So they wanted to hear that. I mean, they you know heard it from the government, but I think hearing it in maybe a different format is helpful. And then also about the environmental benefits and water resource stuff. So so putting it in a sort of social construct of you know a social good, you know take care of the nutrition, take make sure that they understand that feeding their kids this uh, GMO foods is, or foods derived from GMO technology is going to be fine. And then you talk about the other social impact of it and let them know that the food's exactly the same. You know, for sugar, we've tested sugar throughout the process, and the uh, DNA comes comes out of sugar very early in the in the refining process. But uh, but that's beyond. But that doesn't matter. Like GMO, all GMO food is safe. That's that's been well established. So that's just sort of how to message it. I think is is the the big deal. Kind of what they're interested in and meeting them where they are. Hmm. Terry, you've what messages you've you've had experience with with uh, talking directly to consumers what messages work what don't and i want to uh, so i i just want to highlight one of the things that scott was referencing the importance of the messenger and it was discussed earlier as well um it would be difficult to overemphasize that it has to be the right messenger and especially um in the digital space so our research uh, we've, we've looked at number one sources of information for consumers over those 10 years, and it's gone from friends and family, local television, websites most recently. It's search engines. It's Google and Bing. And, and so you have to pay attention to whether you're showing up on those searches. And you better, if it's an issue important to you, if you're not on the first page, you don't exist of those search results. So it's thinking about that digital, that whole mommy guilt and the tribal uh, mentality online and needing that, the millennial moms needing that approval um, from their peers, so finding those food influencers. And by the way, we talked about um, Food Babe a bit ago. In our most recent, Food Babe has continued to fall in terms of trust level in our surveys. In our most recent one, 9% of the population trusts Food Babe. 57% doesn't know who she is. So we sometimes focus on the loudest voices and miss reaching a whole lot more people. So how we navigate that digital space is absolutely critical in this whole conversation. And Phil, to add to that, uh, you know, getting back to the comment about the in environmental or other benefits of the new technologies or even the old technologies, we actually, during our consumer research on GMOs in 2016, we tested not just the FDA considers uh, GMO crops to be safe, we actually tested uh, genetically modified for this benefit, whether it, for example, uh, uh, to uh, disease resistant crops or to reduce uh, chemical or pesticide or herbicide use uh, to, uh, for drought resistance. Those messages test really well with consumers, not as well as the one I, I mentioned earlier about the FDA. And by the way, uh, in the surveys that we did, now again, it's a couple of years, your data is more current and ask a bit differently, but we asked, who do you trust for information about food? The FDA came up number one, and the USDA wasn't far behind, and, and those bloggers you mentioned, they were at the bottom of the list. Even food companies were trusted more than some of these bloggers that would make the most noise on the issue. So the, there, there really needs to be some learnings about, as you said, the loudest noises in the room. Um, and by the way, truster, uh, farmers are one of the most trusted sources. They continue to be year after year. And also, consumers are not, um, they fully understand the need for farmers to make money, to be able to pa raise their families and pass their farms on. They have no problem with that. It's where they get stuck is where they think profitability is put ahead of the public interest. And that's why those values are so important to emphasize. If I could add. I want to stop. Just pause real quickly. Uh, we would love to have questions from the audience. I'm sure you have some uh, and uh, ask them to Slido and the team will get them to me. Go ahead, Scott. So for, for too long, I think the agriculture industry has been silent and allowed, you know, GMO technology to be defined and oftentimes defined in negative ways for marketing gains. And that's something that uh, I think we're seeing a shift in that. I think we're all stepping up and being more proactive. And so because we haven't been as, uh, haven't talked about it as much. You have these groups that are uh, maligning the technology uh, that uh, just basically it's, it's false and the things they're saying about it. And so consumers who uh, they might not be as well informed about it. And some people actually believe that, you know, GMOs might be bad, which is very unfortunate. And we're trying to change that mindset. Go ahead. I think if someone in the last group, I think it was Nina referred to the Jimmy Kimmel video 
if, if you have not seen it, at the next break, YouTube it. it it's amazingly enlightening. The one the farm market, the farmer's yeah. market in I mean, LA, if, yeah. yeah. If you have not done it, it's worth looking at. And I, I, I go back, I don't get, yes, we have to address people you know, fighting against GMOs and, and, and a lot of the kind of headwinds we face with innovation, but I, I really, I don't worry about it too much, to be honest with you. I think there are a lot of people who are vocal against certain, certain things that are, we're trying to advance, but I think at the end of the day, and I guess it, I'm, I'm going to try and RT, I think the, the person walking into the supermarket in their day-to-day -day life, by and large, is probably less concerned about all of that. I think there are certain pockets, and I think someone mentioned, there, there are pockets of people who are very, very concerned about animal welfare. There are certain people that are very concerned about certain issues that I think someone said in the last group that they, you know, they take their money and they, they support that cause. But I think overall, consumers... As they, as they deal with their daily lives, a lot of the things we talk about and a lot of the headwinds we face, they're not, they're not, they're not that, they, they kind of have a more rational approach to that. I think they have a much more logical sense to that of what's in, what's, what are the benefits of it, what are the true benefits, what are the concerns, and, and if some of the advancements we make can make their lives better and we can show true, kind of immediate, substantial, and certain value, a lot of the noise and misconception goes away when you actually talk to them about it and, and, or when they actually see benefits and see what's in front of it for them. I, I think we need to not get knocked off course by a lot of the noise that comes at us. I think when it all shakes out, but you have we'll to, get through it. Don't you have to balance that with a recognition of the dramatic impact on agriculture social license that has come from consumer um, led advocacy? I, I do. I mean, I'm, saying, I'm not saying we just go home and never talk about it. I'm not saying that we stop doing what we're doing, but I think also we don't want to take our eye off the ball. I mean, we, I, I, I think we have to address those headwinds. I don't think we can ignore them, but I do think that a lot of those headwinds are not, not necessarily coming. They're consumer headwinds, but I'm not sure those are all of our consumers. I think there's, there, are, there are pockets of voices that are very loud and very vocal, but I think there are larger pockets of consumers behind that that don't necessarily share that concern. They hear that we have to be worried about it because those consumers hear those concerns and they read those concerns, but I'm not so sure they necessarily share or empathize with those concerns as much as, as we think they do. Um, I mean, again, it's, I go back to the gestation crate. We switched to gestation crate and everybody was happy about that, but no one cared enough to give us a penny a pound for it. So we did it and I'm glad we did it and we do it all over again because it was the right thing to do, but we did it because there were a lot of vocal people out there saying stuff, but at the end of the day, the, the person going into the supermarket on Saturday morning wasn't going to give us anything for it, so exactly how concerned were they about I don't know if I'm articulating that well. But I do well, think but... how we engage, particularly around gene editing, will impact whether the technology is accepted, even if a large portion of the population doesn't care. I, 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 absolutely, and I think it, it matters to that group, and it also matters, matters to the groups that they influence who are decision makers that allow us to do what we want to do. So I, I, but I think, I guess the reason I'm, I'm, I say I'm less concerned about it is because at the end of the day, the person going into the supermarket and buying our products are the people who are ultimately going to make that decision, and I think that Again, I'm not belittling the headwinds we have, but I'm, I'm op more, much more optimistic about our long-term success in tackling these problems because at the end of the day, I think the person buying the product at the counter is going to be a lot more rational about that decision. I want to touch on the, the, the disclosure, disclosure law, the labeling, labeling issue. We talked about USDA is in the final weeks, months of writing this proposed rule to implement the law that was passed in uh, the summer of uh, 2016. That law will require all companies to uh, at least digital, digitally disclose whether their ingredients are genetically engineered. You know, and now USDA is deciding what exactly will have to be disclosed in there. How how broad is that? Uh, those definitions going to be? Um, I hear you, Kelly, and maybe to some extent Terry, saying that uh, transparency is is a good thing and ultimately will um, benefit this technology. Um, 
I would like to throw it out to you, all, all four of you. How broadly should that, um, let's put it this way, shouldn't, it's a question we had in the, that I had to begin with. Wouldn't it be wise to, um, based on what Kelly and Terry said, to, to make it as broad as possible, a uh, broader definition as possible? And um, number two, why not put it on the label? Uh, not just uh, a QR code, why not just put it on the label like uh, uh, Campbell has done? Uh, can, with, with, additional, with additional kind of language, with FDA saying it's safe. How do you feel about that, Will? Since... Um, I, think, I think what we... I'm gonna be the contrarian again here. I, I think we should be transparent. I, I, I do. I think that if consumers are concerned about it, we should tell them about it. I think, I think in everything we do, transparency is the key. And I think, I, 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 again, it doesn't, I don't get worried about it. I, I don't, because I think if people care about it, they'll see it and they'll read about it. And, you know, I, I the, when you, when you, when you, people, you, someone said that negative news travels fast, 10 times faster. Also, in the absence of information, the human mind goes to the negative. Why are you not telling me something? The only reason you're not telling me something is because you don't want to tell me what it is. That's our minds process information that way. If you're not going to tell me, there's a reason, and the reason is probably bad. And, you know, you can, you can not like that, but that's the way we work. Or, you know, it's just the way we are. I mean, it, I think that's how nature is because the unknown is potentially dangerous. Um, I think, you know, if you go back to Tylenol, Tylenol had the recall of that. I mean, that's one of the, if you want to learn about dealing with issues, read the Harvard Business Study, Harvard Business School case study on Tylenol and how they just went out and said everything. By the time they were done on the recall, there were no questions to ask. No one, you, at the end of the interview, there, no one, it was silent because they had answered every question so transparently that all the media, there was no story. There was nothing to write because they told every media vehicle everything all at once. There was no scoop to be had. There was no nothing. There was nothing. And it, they have a 35 share of the analgesic category today after having a major, major recall. Transparency to me is it's the only long-term solution. When you say consumers don't care, it won't affect their, if it's labeled or, or the, the broad definition, it won't affect their decision making. I think, I think if we're transparent, I think if we're transparent about GMOs, the consumers that care will care and the consumers that don't. Well, I, I just don't think that, I don't think that trying to reduce our, reduce the messaging does well. I think, I think, I think giving consumers the right information to make an informed decision is, is the path. But Kelly, uh, just add, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to just add to that. One of the most interesting learnings we did from our research in 2016, and it was what we call verbatims, where people add additional comments or react to something that we tell them in an open-ended kind of a question. Uh, we had several people say, you know what, I have some concerns about GMOs, but because you're willing to share that information with me, that's fine. Or uh, they feel like that we're trusting them to make the decision. We're giving them the power to decide whether or not that's a concern of their own. And so when you empower consumers with the information, it's, it builds trust. That's where the transparency really comes into play. So we spent several years digging into transparency and what does that actually mean to the consumer? And consumer engagement is a big part of that. They want to be heard, they want to be listened to, engaged, and if they feel like you've given them a respectful response, then they often are willing to accept it even if it doesn't align with their views. Um, we also know that transparency doesn't mean data dumps. You know, when transparency first became a buzzword, I think there were some companies that um, thought that means we show everything, and that's not at all the case. It's about, um, there are about seven different elements, but, but it really comes down to sharing the, the information that they're interested in, in a way that they can understand it, and having integrity, and um, being truthful, you know, some fairly basic and, yeah, and the language really matters. I mean, you held up that first tomato soup can, Phil, earlier with the, what I called the Vermont label. And we tested the Vermont label, by the way, to see if consumers liked it. Of all that, we had eight different label designs on disclosing GMOs, and it rated last. 
because they hated the fact it didn't really tell them anything. It said partially produced with genetic engineering. Well, what's partially produced with genetic engineering? And what's this phrase, genetic engineering? It's scary. Uh, they don't use that kind of language. They refer to GMO. So give them the language that they're used to and can relate with in a, in a very transparent way and even constructive way if you really want to talk about benefits. And boy, they respond really well to that. They really do. Scott, you've had some yeah. experience with, with labor. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to, to talk asked? about this a little bit. So I think, you know, as we think about the, the mandatory labeling law that is within uh, the marketing section of USDA, it has nothing to do with safety or anything like that. So it's a marketing standard, but it's a mandatory label. So we have to be careful to look at it under the constructs that Congress passed. And Congress, if you look at the law, it said that it has to have uh, DNA in it that couldn't otherwise be obtained other th than through, uh, you know, recombinant uh, DNA technology, or basically if it has GMO ingredients in it, above a threshold set by the secretary. So that's, that's important to know. That's the mandatory standard. I think what, uh, you know, Kelly and Will are talking about are more uh, voluntary uh, disclosures, which, you know, this law would do nothing to prevent voluntary disclosures, you know, and uh, quite frankly, through the QR code or any uh, digital uh, disclosure they would they would want to make they could tell you know it'd be a good way for them to tell their story tell tell the positive benefits of GMO technology but but I think we need to be careful to, to not I mean Congress passed a law and US the Secretary of Agriculture has to implement that law according to you know he has to implement the standard according to that law so there's sort of different different things here mm -hmm. what has been your experience in the last couple of years with sugar, because you really, it was really, I think, ramp, ramping up to the, uh, to the Vermont law that you saw some companies starting, starting to do some switch in the type of sugar they used. What, what's happened since then? So I think, as I said before, I think, I think uh, you know, having, uh, first off, having a national standard or having an understanding that a national standard was going to be in place uh, made things calm down quite a bit. I mean, the issue with having a Vermont do something, then it's like you could have all these different states having a patchwork of different regulations, which would make it very difficult for, uh, you know, uh, Smithfield and, and Campbell's to sell products across state lines. Like, I mean, they'd have to have a label for every state. You'd only be able to sell, sell into Vermont or into Colorado or into California. So I think having a national standard was, was very helpful, you know, to prevent that because it would just be very disruptive to commerce. And uh, I think, you know, I think having that, that, you know, I think once we get some, some further clarity on what the actual rule is going to look like, I think that's going to be, you know, very helpful as well. And, uh, but but I, think, I think things have quieted down quite a bit. Terry, I want to ask you, because I know you've, you've been doing some, you all have been doing some work with some companies, some trade associations, in terms of, of helping them address, maybe move forward in addressing the biotech issue and communicating to consumers. Uh, tell us a little bit about... Um, that experience and what these uh, th these industries are finding out. So I really think you're seeing um, growing awareness of the value of engaging even those skeptical consumer advocacy groups. And I'm not talking about the activists, the out of reach groups, the extremist groups, but those skeptical groups that maybe have, have given the food system a hard time from time to time. Um, there are companies, there's one, one of the major food companies that has completely flipped its philosophy from battling with those groups to literally inviting them to the table before they put out new guidelines and goals and say, what do you think? What are your recommendations? And they actually share an example of um, a, a most recent set of, of goals that they took probably two of many, many, many recommendations and when they were publicly released then because they had engaged those groups, they were widely applauded for something that they would have been criticized, you know, forward, backward, and sideways for had they not engaged those groups, or at least that's how they felt about it. Same thing with a lot of trade associations. Changing from that defensive posture, defending an interest, building trust is very different from defending an interest. So changing those postures to one of engagement and saying, okay, well, tell us how you feel and why you feel that way, and let's talk about where our values align and figure out a way forward. And they're finding a lot of success with that approach. I want to wrap up here with, I want to ask each one of you to say, what is the single most important message that you would give to 
um, food, and I want to say in your case, Scott, to, to farm groups, the single most important message you would have to them about how to ensure that consumers uh, will want to buy their products five, ten years from now, from, from based on what you've learned, what's the most important thing? So, so this is something, I guess, probably personal to me. So I'm fourth generation uh, farming family from Florida, citrus. And so I understand what it's like to you know, be close to a farm. But not everybody, not everybody understands what it is to farm. And I think people are probably a little bit fascinated by it. And I think uh, you know, farmers all across the country are all ambassadors. And they need to embrace that and understand that they, people look to them for, and they have, they have a trust. Uh, people trust farmers. And they shouldn't be afraid to talk to people, talk to their friends, and uh, you know, get on social media and talk about these things because they already have a, a uh, you know, people trust them and, and look to them uh, for advice on these things. So be an ambassador, that, that's my advice. I would have to say it's that values alignment. It's being able to convey how what you're doing or why you're doing it aligns with the values of those you're talking to and I couldn't agree more with you about farmers being ambassadors and not being afraid to engage. 65 to 80 percent of the population knows very little about food and ag and how it's produced, but the great thing is they really want more information. They're very interested and curious, so there's an opportunity there. Uh, it's time for the farm to fork community to knock down silos <coughs> and really collaborate and talk with each other. Uh, one of the biggest aha moments, Phil, of this GMO disclosure law debate that we had leading up to and through Vermont and now for the rule is, is that when we made our decision to embrace labeling on GMOs, uh, I was deputized to go, out, go forth and, and spread the gospel, if you will, to uh, all the various farm and food groups. So I spoke to 24 different stakeholder groups from wheat growers to farm bureaus, and I discovered that we weren't talking to each other across our sectors. And it's just as bad at my own company. I'll sit in the meeting at Campbell Soup Company, I'll look across the room, and I'm the oldest one in the room, which is becoming increasingly obvious or more, more prevalent. And I'm seeing these 35, 30-year-old 30 suburban urban kids, and sometimes I'll pipe up and say, who's here was raised on a farm? And it's like, dead silence. So we have taken the liberty of inviting people like we had the Kentucky Farm Bureau to Campbell last summer. We have made an effort to reach out and try to build better dialogue. It was, I really appreciated before the merger that both Dow and DuPont invited me out to Iowa and to Indiana to learn more about genetic editing and new techniques. And as long as we start having those kind of discussions, collaborations, education, getting people on farms. I've now I'm taking Campbell employees to the Pennsylvania Farm Show just so they can see what farmers are like. I mean, when my own food company is having to do that, you can tell that we've got a real issue with doing it. So let's start breaking down some of those silos and talking and collaborating more so we can learn from you and you can learn from us who face the consumers every day. And let's bring the retailers in too while we're at it. Well, I'd like to echo what Terry said, and I think it, it's about values. You have to define your values. And, and stick to those, have a point of view on all of the issues that, and then internally focused. I mean, I, I would look internally first to set your values. Don't listen to what's going on. What are your corporate values on all of these issues? What is your corporate position or your, your company's position on all those? And then and embrace those. And I think that's an empowering thing. When, then, you, then when you have that position and, and you kind of recognize that I'm guessing that most people, when you go do that, you'll realize that doing well and doing good are not mutually exclusive, and that that'll give you the courage, and we do that, to reach out to what we're considered adversaries and sit down and talk, and all of a sudden your values start making sense, and you can, you can do just that. I mean, we, we, I'll give you an example. We, Smithfield, everybody knows that you can look it up. We, got, we had the largest lawsuit against Smithfield in, in the history of the state of Virginia against us for polluting water. And our CEO at the time, Larry Pope, said, we're never going to have this happen again. And Terry, uh, Dennis Tracy, who now is, heads our foundation, was the prosecuting attorney that won that case. And Larry said, we're never going to have this happen again as long as this company. He went out and hired Dennis Tracy. Dennis Tracy became our chief sustainability officer. And the, 
the um, grounds for a dentist joining were, you are truly going to get a sustainability program, because if you don't, I'm going to go back to the prosecutor's office, and that's going to be a really bad day for you. And I would just highlight it, what you said about values are not a talking point. No. They can't be a mess. If they aren't authentic, it's not going to work. So it, those values have to be demonstrated not only in what you say, but in what you do. So we hire dentists, and we have sustainability pillars. They're talked about at every meeting. They're in every sales presentation. They're in every, they are pillars that we talk about at every gathering of our company. And if you do that, all of a sudden, you chart your course. And I think, I think it, it just unlocks a lot of potential. Thank you. Join me in uh, thanking our panel. <laughs>